you would please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 14. We're going to be reading together verses 1 through 9. Hear now the word of God. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? The reading of the Holy Gospel. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that the same Holy Spirit who inspired these words would speak to us anew. Teach us, Lord, what we need to know. Show us what we need to see. To be better disciples of Jesus Christ in this place and at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, happy 4th of July. Um, I tried to explain once to a British friend of mine the significance of the 4th of July. And I said, well, let me put it to you this way. If you ask them on their birthday, they give you the month and the day, April 2nd. If you ask someone, when is Christmas? They say, December 25th. When is Thanksgiving this year? November 25th. When is Labor Day? September 2nd, whatever. Ask them, when is Independence Day? And they say, the 4th of July. They switch it. For some reason, we don't say the month and the day. We say the day and the month. The 4th of July. It's like it's, it's emblazoned in our psyche that there's something unique about this date. I think that's kind of cool. It may not mean anything, but I just thought it was an interesting way to get this guy off my back. Now, as you have probably already figured out from previous messages I've given, I am not a fan of civic religion at all. Um, I think when we convolute our religious beliefs with our political convictions, um, we can get into a lot of trouble. It very often leads to a kind of Christian nationalism, which I find particularly pernicious. I also don't subscribe to American exceptionalism, frankly or the manifest destiny that we were taught in my generation as being a brute fact. These are concepts that I understand have been replaced with a much more humble and sober understanding of our historic past, especially our expansionist past, and that's a good thing. But that said, I do count myself a patriot. And the difference between nationalism and patriotism is that nationalism is a very perverse self-aggrandizement based on the belief that we are superior in some way to another nation or another race or whatever it might be. Patriotism, on the other hand, is an actual affection for, a love and an appreciation for the sacrifices of those who have gone before us. And also, an affection for our ideals. I love the basic ideal that the United States was built upon. So I count myself 
a patriot in that regard. So it's very easy for me to say happy Independence Day. I will fly the flag today, along with the British flag, but that's another story. <laughs> but you know, the ideal that I'm referring to, Martin Luther King summed up as America's creed. In the famous I Have a Dream speech, Martin Luther King said he dreamt of a day when America would live up to her creed. And he took a portion of the document whose signing we celebrate today, the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, he was absolutely right. That is a creed. That is a faith statement. In fact, it's a theological proposition. We hold these truths. And you know, the concept of a truth, much less a self-evident truth, but the concept of a truth actually runs contrary to contemporary thinking in our postmodern mindset, which is built on a hermeneutic of suspicion, to quote my friend Paul Fetus, a hermeneutic of suspicion. Truth is nothing more than a romantic relic of the past. There's no such thing as truth. And I believe that is objectively wrong. And it is absolutely correct for the foundational principle of the American experiment to be a belief in truth. In fact, I would go so far as to say without truth or a belief in truth, you cannot actually have a properly functioning civil society. And we are feeling the pain of that reality in our post-truth culture today. And we have a post-truth culture because we have a post-faith culture. In order to believe in truth, you must believe in from whence it came. Which is why, by the way, I actually prefer Thomas Jefferson's version of this quotation than the one we have saved for posterity. Benjamin Franklin changed Jefferson's words. Jefferson originally said, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. To be sacred and undeniable. In other words, he believed that these truths were revealed by God. They were holy. Franklin, maybe he was thinking about his friend David Hume or Voltaire or other contemporaries of his, maybe he thought, let's not have that religious language in here. Let's talk about self-evident truth. That would have rung very true with the Enlightenment moral philosophers of his day. But actually, in all apologies to Hume and Voltaire and the others, and Franklin, I think Jefferson had it right. We hold these truths because all truth is revealed truth. In fact, I would say there is no such thing as a self-evident truth. I believe that's a contradiction in terms. Why? Because all truth belongs to God. And if all truth belongs to God, all truth must be revealed by God. And I think that is exactly what we see in the gospel reading today. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And I would say he is also the ultimate happiness we all seek. If you have seen me, Jesus said, you have seen the Father the fount of all truth. And here's one of the great ironies of this. The generation 
upon which the Enlightenment philosophers were suckled were all believing Christians. Adam Smith studied at the feet of Hitchinson, Francis Hitchinson, a theologian of the highest order, as well as a moral philosopher. John Locke was a Calvinist, all rise. <laughs> John Locke was a Calvinist, believed in the divine inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. And if only Franklin had taken the time to go to these scriptures, and by the way, Franklin wrote often about his own Calvinist upbringing. Most of his aphorisms point back to his Calvinist parents. If he had gone to the scriptures and remembered that the revelation of God in Christ is the truth, then maybe, maybe, our founding fathers wouldn't have stumbled on the first hurdle of this ideal. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They fell at that first hurdle on two counts. The first count, all men, Excuse me? All men? What about the other 50% of the population? Oops! Now, look, I understand how moral reasoning evolves. I'm not throwing the founding fathers under the bus here. But in retrospect, they stumbled at that hurdle. It took 150 years for women to get the right to vote. And secondly, they never dealt with America's original sin of slavery. They didn't mean it when they said all men are created equal. They meant white men are created equal. And that is something we on our foundational birthday can't ignore. You can be a patriot, you can love this country, and I do. And you can hold up the ideals that we stand for, and I do. But we can't ignore the elephant in the room, which is that we stumbled over the first hurdle. If only they had read Paul's letter to Philemon. You know, one of the great ironies of Paul's letter to Philemon is that people who tried to defend slavery used this letter as a defense. Their argument was, well, he didn't say anything about the institution of slavery, so therefore he must have just approved of it. What nonsense. That is such bad theology. Because you cannot make an argument from silence. Let me say that again. It is bad theology. Because you cannot make an argument from silence. He wasn't addressing institutional racism. It wasn't even on the table. To someone living in the Roman Empire in the first century AD, slavery was a brute fact. And Paul believed Christ was coming imminently. But this letter is, in fact, the most exceptional refutation of slavery ever written up to that time. He totally refutes human bondage. He totally refutes slavery. Why? Not because he attacked the legality of it. He attacked the immorality of it. He undermines the concept completely because he takes from it any moral pretense. It is the most wonderful letter. Here he is writing to Philemon. A person which we know a little about. But someone who is clearly a, a very influential and wealthy Christian living in Colossae. And he writes to his wife and his son. And he's not writing alone, by the way. He's got Timothy with him and he's got Mark with him. And he's got this fugitive slave with him. Onesimus. 
Now we know even less about Onesimus than we know about Philemon. But let me give an analogy. Philemon was the Dred Scott of this New Testament epic. Philemon was the Dred Scott. And so Paul writes to Philemon, and in the first seven verses, you know, some cynics say, oh, he was buttering him up, right? Oh, and I pray to the Lord, I give thanks that you're so wonderful and you're so gracious and you're so good. Blah, blah, blah. Actually, he's not buttering him up. He's appealing to what he has become in Christ. And he makes that clear in verses 8 and 9. And he says, look, I'm Paul. If I want to, I can command this, but I'm not going to. Instead, I'm going to appeal to your sense of love in Christ. And I'm appealing on behalf of my son, Onesimus. My son, my beloved flesh in Christ. And he makes a little wordplay, by the way, where he says, before he was useless, now he's useful. The name Onesimus actually means useful one. So he makes a little wordplay here. He was useless, actually, as a slave because you didn't appreciate his true value as a human being, as a brother, as a fellow sojourner created in the image of God. Now he's going to be useful to you because you will be made better by loving him and being loved by him. And oh, by the way, if he owes you anything because he is a fugitive and you have legal rights to ask for recompense, send the bill to me. And he even writes it in his own hand. Only a few times does Paul ever use his own hand. And he says in his own hand, you charge it to me. Because I love him. And you are going to love him. When you treat him as a person and not as property. And I do love the end of the letter where he says, and make a room ready for me because I might be coming to visit you. In other words, you're going to get the full wrath in person if you don't do the right thing. So, you know what? I think we have a, an important lesson to learn here on America's birthday. Because slavery is our original sin in the sense that we still feel its effects. We still feel its effects. It hasn't gone away. The systemic and ingrained injustices that exist against people of color in this country are irrefutable to anyone who takes the time to look at the facts. So the question is, what are we going to do about it? We can either say that, well, those ideals don't really matter. You know, there is no such thing as objective truth. And, you know, let's just move on. Let's just, just kind of move on. Or we can say, we love this country. We do believe in those values. And yes, our founding fathers may have stumbled over that first hurdle. But guess what? The race isn't over. In fact, it turns out it wasn't even hurdles. It was a relay. And we've got the baton. What are we going to do with it? How are we going to bring redemption? How are we going to overcome that original sin? Paul tells us through love. If only we could find that kind of love, that kind of sacrificial love 
that brought Jesus to the cross for my sake and yours and Onesimus's and everyone else. That, to me, is the best way to celebrate the 4th of July. Amen. Amen.